Good morning, everyone. I'd like to go ahead and get us started here. I'm Kelly Bourne, Executive Director of the Cyber Policy Center here at Stanford University. And today our webinar is going to focus on questions around technology and well being. And we are fortunate to be joined today by Jeff Hancock, who's an affiliate here at the Cyber Policy Center, a professor in Stanford's Department of Communications, and the founding director of the Stanford Social Media Lab as well as Amy Orban from Emmanuel College in the UK, whose research, amongst other things, explores social media use and teenage mental health. And finally, by Erica Pelevin from My Digital Tattoo, a Silicon Valley nonprofit focused on building healthy habits, critical thinking, and thoughtful online behavior. And Erica has been working a lot with schools, including Jeff here at Stanford, and healthcare professionals across the country. Uh, quickly for background, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Cyber Policy Center, our research and teaching focuses on digital technology and questions around security, geopolitics, and democracy. We're home to about a half dozen programs, and our work is really intended to help inform the policy agenda of governments, academics, civil society leaders, and tech platforms globally. And we are hosting these webinars now every other Wednesday at 10 a.m. PST with experts from around the world. Um, a little bit about today's focus, uh, as I said, on tech and well-being, which I think is especially important now, given our massive increase in, in technology use under COVID. And so before going into this uh, with our colleagues, just a couple of facts. Uh, before COVID, everyone was online a lot. We have research suggesting that 30% of people said they were online almost constantly, and this is before COVID, with 45% of teens saying the same. And that's up from just 25% of teens saying that in 2014. So these numbers are growing. Uh, we see that tech use daily before COVID was on average globally about six hours and 45 minutes a day, half of that on mobile devices with the US right in the middle and the Philippines and Brazil at close to 10 hours a day, Germany and Japan only three or four hours a day. And of course this has increased dramatically under COVID we see that YouTube, TikTok, and Twitch usage are all up 15 to 20%, Facebook up 25%, Nextdoor up 73%, Google Classroom up 150%, I'm surprised not more given my children's use of that, and Zoom up more than 400% at 300 million users now daily. So significant usage of technology, and I think there's been a lot of discussion about both the harms and the benefits of that, which we wanna to explore today. On the harm side, we've heard a lot about how uh, the impact of technology use on how our minds work, our capacity for analytical thinking, memory, focus, creativity, and reflection, concerns about addiction, social divisiveness, anxiety and depression, information overload, and the lack of in-person connection. And then we also hear a lot about how technology helps us through connections like this, uh, through access to real-time information and services, especially health services under COVID, and through uh, increases in our general contentment, our ability to meet partners, volunteer, and so forth. So there has been much discussion about this. And the last thing I'll say was based on some Pew research in the last few months that found that half of experts predicted, tech experts, that individuals' well-being will be more helped than harmed by digital life in the next decade. A third said it would be more harmed than helped and 21% are predicting about no change at all. So I'll be curious to hear uh, what our colleagues say uh, today. I wanna to start with Jeff, and Jeff would turn to you to share what you see as the biggest risks or concerns around our use of technology, as well as the biggest benefits and opportunities. I'd love in particular for you to talk about your recent meta-analysis on the impact of social media on our overall, overall well-being. I found that fascinating and then any uh, relevant COVID-related research that you wanna cover. And then from there, I wanna to turn to Amy for you to talk about what you see as the relationship between social media use and life satisfaction, how you see all of this varying across different types of apps and different types of users, and then putting it all in historical perspective, you know, what you think about the moment that we are in with digital technology as it compares to, I don't know, books or radio. And then Erica, lastly, would love to turn to you to share with us what you think of as the best sort of principles or philosophies to better support kids' use of technology, and also what you've been seeing around how kids are using 
tech platforms to help support their mental health and stay connected during the pandemic. And then we'll save uh, hopefully 30 minutes or so for Q&A. So please, anyone feel free to enter questions in the chat uh, box and I'll do my best to moderate those as well. Uh, but first, thanks to the panelists and Jeff, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Kelly, and thank you for inviting us and, uh, and organizing this panel. And hello to everybody uh, out there. i um, excited to talk about today. This is something I'm really uh, passionate about. I think it's important anytime I talk to any parent, um, there's you know, real concerns about uh, how their kids are interacting with uh, technology. But when I talk to almost anybody, they're concerned about the world in general, uh, about their parents. So there's real concerns about how technology is doing what it's doing to society. And I think this is not um, unreasonable because it is having such a tremendous uh, change. The amount of change just in the last two decades, if we think back to the 90s to now, it's, it's pretty serious change. Whenever that happens, there's um, deep concerns about the technology that's doing that. And, and Amy can speak to that a little bit. She's done some really nice work, has a paper out on historical aspects of these kind of moral panics about technology that I really recommend to everyone. It's fantastic. Um, but whenever there is these kinds of technological disruptions, it does mean that there are vulnerable populations and there can be real uh, issues. So I want to um, jump into some of the research that we did and then um, kind of look forward to some of the research and ideas that I think we need to move towards. Um, I did a large meta-analysis with my team uh, in the social media lab. Uh, Hannah Michkowski is one of the people and she's in the audience here today that worked on this, um, looking at hundreds of articles. And the reason that I wanted to do that was I was receiving kind of updates and alerts about research around social media. And one day it would be that uh, things like Facebook um, increased loneliness. And then the next day would be that it improves um, social connectedness. It just wasn't making sense. So I wanted to take a look instead of individual studies um, across what the field of evidence could tell us about. And when we looked at the uh, research, this is about 2006 up until 2018, 2019, um, there were a lot of studies, uh, 226 uh, of them, and in there was over 200,000 participants. We, we know a fair bit. Unfortunately, a lot of the work was pretty correlational. And I'm just gonna share a slide here with you. Uh, just give you a little bit of a background on this. So we wanted to take a look at how often people use social media, which is the number one concern that parents and, and almost everybody has. How much are we using this? Is it affecting us? And whether that's connected to our well-being. And we, did, we looked at all, all these studies, and a meta-analysis allows you to take apples and oranges and turn them all into the same kind of fruit and look at what is the effect across all these studies. And what we ended up finding was a very small correlation, uh, not significant. It's equal to 0.01. Um, and as Amy and others have found in literature, when you look at these large scale studies, the, the effects are very, very small and tend to be not significant. And so there isn't a straight up relationship between how often we use screen time and our well being. And whenever I tell people this, they're like, what? How can that be? And they're right to be suspicious of this because, in fact, it can have a little bit of an effect with anxiety uh, that can be negative and make us feel worse but it, it's offset by the value you get in learning about what's going on with your family and friends and feeling socially connected. And those are like kind of obvious when we step back and think, well, what could the values and, and harms be rather than just technologies doing things to us? I think another problem with the research so far and the way it's covered in the media is the way we've been focusing on screen time. Uh, when we look back through history at these moral panics and even now, we have a very much like a dose metaphor, a mindset where the more you get of this thing, the worse it is. And it's all focused on screen time. As if, you know, me connecting with, say, my mom on Canada's Day, which is today, Happy Canada Day, everybody. Uh, me connecting through social media with my mom is the same as, say, me being mean to somebody or or, or stalking my ex-girlfriend or something like that. It equates those two things, which are psychologically very different, as exactly the same because it's the amount of time on the screen. When we take back, a step back and think of it that way, it's pretty clear that that doesn't seem right and that screen time is really problematic. And I think mindsets uh, really matter. One of my students at the Social Media Lab has been working on this mindsets idea. She came up with this notion that mindsets about social media could matter. And it goes something like this. If you think that social media is addictive and it's like screen time dosage, 
then when you do need to use it, because many people in current society are using it regularly, need to use it for schoolwork or to find out where the soccer game is, et cetera, you think it's addictive, you've used it, you feel bad about yourself and you feel guilty. And that's going to be harmful for you because you feel bad, even though you've just used the device. Whereas if you feel that this is a tool, a powerful tool that you'll probably make mistakes with, when you use it, you realize that you're in charge and you're doing that and you're responsible for your actions with it. So I think these mindsets really matter. And to date, researchers and scientists, including myself, have sort of focused on screen time. And I think that's led to a really problematic way for us to think about it. And it ignores the fact that in my view, psychology matters much more than technology. I think that's really, really the key conclusion here. Okay, so what can we do going forward? Well, um, there's been other technologies that have been actually quite harmful for us and have benefits. The car uh, continues to kill many people. It's one of the most common ways that um, people are killed in the U.S. anyways. And uh, back in the 70s when I was growing up, and this is the car that my dad had, uh, we weren't uh, rich, but my dad loved uh, the idea of a Continental, a Lincoln Continental. So we were carted around in this car all the time, and um, they would smoke. Both my parents smoked at the time. Um, we didn't have seatbelts on. And, you know, you think back to it, and it was like deadly time, indeed. They were, but people didn't want to just give up tech, you know, cars or somehow limit car time. Instead, what we did is we developed regulations. So uh, drinking and driving became illegal. Uh, wearing seatbelts was mandatory. A lot of regulation came into place. We developed technology. So now my car will, will ding at me angrily until I put my seatbelt on. And we have um, uh, safety bags, et cetera, airbags and those kind of things. Uh, we developed new norms. So there isn't a law against smoking in a car with children. But that just doesn't happen anymore. People will be very judgmental towards that. Uh, you can also drink and drive and not necessarily get caught, but that's now frowned upon very seriously. So we developed new ways of thinking about how we behave with the technology. And education changed a lot. Uh, when I got my learner's license, I had that for 30 days. And then after a test, I was able to drive by myself and with my friends. Uh, and as a male adolescent, that's pretty dangerous. Now it takes about a year to get through all of that sort of thing. So I think we can change the way we think about technology by um, thinking more about how young people are using it. Um, yes, there are real risks, uh, especially around uh, bullying. Uh, porn seems to be coming at children more and more and at younger and younger ages. And Erica can talk more about the real risks and benefits that kids face. But it also needs to be more science-based rather than just this overall concern. And I think we want both kids, but also society in general and older adults who are really using technology much more and in really positive and powerful ways to thrive. And what I mean here is instead of just thinking about screen time, think about what we can do to maximize the positives and minimize the negatives. And since uh, Erica and Amy will talk a little bit about younger people, I'll just conclude by saying, let's think about older folks, for example, and especially COVID-19. We've been doing research right now that suggests they're under a particular threat with the pandemic. They're already socially isolated and lonely, and they're being asked to use technology more, and yet they're the number one vector for um, uh, misinformation, both around uh, the pandemic, but also about cures. So they're being targeted, but they also have these real powers and assets that aren't really thought about. They have a lot of time. They're very civically engaged. And they want to do well. They want to help the, their, their community. And so I think we need to do much more research with older folks to help them overcome the threats that they're facing, which is legitimate, and help them uh, thrive online as they go through this pandemic and increase sort of isolation. So I'll pause there and return to uh, the other panelists. And um, thank you all very much for your attention. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Jeff. Really helpful. And I've, I've always so appreciated your underscoring that point that it's not how much time we spend online, it's what we're doing. And, and to your last point, I was just fascinated to see that something like, I think, 30 or 40 percent of the, the quote unquote silent generation born before 1945 are actually online and using social media and have tablets, which I had somehow not really appreciated. So that's yeah. a great point. And um, Amy, can we turn to you now? Yes, great. Um, thank you, Jeff. That was a great introduction. Um, well, and talk in general. <laughs> um, wait, I'm just going to share my screen and I'll... Um, there we go. Um, you should be able to see my slides now. So 
Yeah, thanks for the, the Cyber Policy Center for inviting me. Um, I research mainly adolescents, and as Jeff has already mentioned, so most of what I'll be talking about is uh, technology and young people. Um, so, and because I only have a very short amount of time, I wanted to kind of do a whistle stop tour about all the things that we know, <laughs> and then to show actually the big things that we don't know. Um, and I, I hope it will, it, it will make sense. Um, so I'll focus mainly on the link between screen time and adolescent well-being. Sometimes I'll digress into social media use and, and life satisfaction in particular, because that's what I've been focusing on recently in the last year. Um, but in general, as Jess already said, the link between screen time and also adolescent well-being, not just well-being in general, is something in between null and, and negative. So there's been multiple meta-analyses and systematic reviews and by governments and by researchers. And if you look at the correlations cross-sectionally, they're all near to zero or, or very slightly negative. And so my second point here is that if they're slightly negative, they're very, very small. So that puts us into kind of a bit of a conundrum because then you start debating what is small, um, kind of what, how should policy react to that, et cetera. But what it does show us is, is, yeah, that if we open a data set and we look at kind of adolescents and they report how much technology they use, their screen time, and they also report their well-being, we probably find a, a correlation that's either zero or a small negative correlation. But it doesn't really tell us anything about the effect of screen time. A lot of people know the dogma of correlation is not causation, but how technology interacts in our lives makes it very clear that screen time could be decreasing well-being, but also a decrease in well-being, a change in life circumstances might be changing. Technology use in screen time might be increasing it, or a third factor in our lives might be influencing both, causing a correlation that has no causal mechanism whatsoever. For example, low socioeconomic families and low socioeconomic status, um, their children often use a lot more screen time, especially in the US. We have some great stats on that. And they often also score lower on well-being questionnaires, that, which could be a cause of some of these negative correlations. So while there's been a lot of um, interest and speculation and media coverage on these correlations, they actually don't tell us very much. And they don't really tell us anything that is relevant to policy because policy wants to know, you know, what needs to be done and what can be done. Um, and correlations don't tell us a lot for that. So what needs to, what we need to look at is a longitudinal relationship. So does, for example, if I personally increase my social media use or my screen time, um, does that then decrease my, my well-being? And I just want to talk a bit about a study I did with colleagues of mine at Oxford and the University of Hornheim in Germany, which showed that the relationships between social media and life satisfaction are actually pretty complicated. They go in both directions. So this was looking at uh, thousands of teenagers in the UK between the age of 10 and 15. And if a teenager increased their social media use from their own average in one year that predicted a very small decrease in life satisfaction in the next year. However, the opposite was also true that if there was a, if a teenager, teenager's life satisfaction decreased from their own average, that predicted an increase in social media use a year later. So instead of a one way street with technology affecting our lives, Actually, our lives also affect the way we use technologies, which makes it really hard to disentangle what the driver of, you know, all these correlations are that we see reported in the media and discussed on a day to day basis. So it's a lot more complicated than we expect. And this complicating kind of value of this is increased by thinking about the need to to consider individuals. Um, and so this is my fourth point. And I find that the need to think about individuals is best communicated with a metaphor that I often use with journalists when they ask me, you know, does social media decrease adolescent well-being? Um, 
And I often say you wouldn't trust a scientist if I would tell you, I can predict how this adolescent that just walked past me on the street is going to react to eating a chocolate bar like the one we see on the screen. You know, if the adolescent turns out to be a heavy diabetic, that might be really, really harmful. It might even be deadly. However, if the adolescent just come home from a massive sports match and they're really um, yearning for some food, um, some energy to replenish um, their energy levels, then that chocolate bar might be really beneficial for them. So we need to think about the type of adolescent we're talking about. We also need to think about, for example, the frequency. Are we talking about a chocolate bar every second, every minute, every hour, every day for their birthday? And then we need to think about motivations. Um, are they eating the chocolate bar because they're sad or lonely or because they're hungry? And so around food, we already have a lot of the nuance that we need to have when we talk about screen time and, and social media, because it's not as easy as saying this chocolate bar will harm adolescents. We need to think about the types of uses, the types of users, the frequencies, the motivations. And I'll only cover two now. So the first is the type of user. So that is the individual differences that we're all different um, and we need to account for that. It, but then it could also go all the way to maybe trying to figure out, do we have diabetics of screen time? And that's the project I'm funded by at the University of Cambridge now. We already know that individual differences are important from this longitudinal data I talked to you about before. So this is the link of life satisfaction to social media use for teenage girls. And what I mainly want you to, to see is that this is the zero axis showing kind of no effect. And most of the, the effects are to the left. So they're negative. Um, and most of them, the confidence intervals don't overlap zero. So they're statistically significant and negative. However, now it will merge into teenage boys. And teenage boys, we see they're all, all the effects become non-significant um, of life satisfaction predicting social media use. The same as the other way around. So this is social media use predicting life satisfaction. We see teenage boys now. And then teenage girls, we start seeing the kind of directional effects becoming more negative. So if we already see these gender differences, there are probably other individual differences that are much more important that we need to think about. The next is the type of use. Uh, this is something Jeff already mentioned. Um, and I just want to cover kind of one of the most classic now models of this. And that's that, for example, actively using social media, communicating, chatting, posting, it maybe increases social connectedness that increases well-being, but the opposite is also the case that passively using social media, so scrolling, just looking at other people's content might increase social comparison, which in turn decreases well-being. My fifth point that I'm getting to the end of my talk um, is that there's a lack in evidence um, of this link. We, so as I said, there's it's near null, it's small if it's correlation, it's bi-directional and incredibly complex if we start looking longitudinally. And so a lot of very kind of high impact investigations into this, like the chief medical officer for England, um, reported that they actually couldn't figure out whether screen time or social media use is actually bad or good because the evidence is not available. And the last more complicating factor um, is that these concerns that we have around technologies are reoccurring and it's something that I've been thinking about a huge amount in the last year. And it's actually from a paper, I read a paper by somebody working out of San Francisco and actually did some of her studies at Stanford, uh, Mary Preston about the radio, um, where she found in 1940s that, you know, the majority of American children were addicted to the radio. They use it like alcohol. It affects their body, it affects their health, and it will have long-term consequences. And, you know, this is very similar to the, the debate we're going to have now as well. You know, are screens addictive? How do they affect our children? And so we need to sometimes think in the meta perspective and start questioning why are we having these conversations, you know? And so I just want to highlight that as Jeff said, I have a recent paper out talking about this cyclicity of technology panics. I, it was actually officially published today. So on my Twitter feed, I, actually, I uploaded a, a YouTube lecture on this. So if you're interested in the meta perspective, um, do have a look. 
and I'm also happy to answer any questions or feed this into the discussion. So just to conclude, what we know is that it's complicated um, and we definitely need more work before we can, we can figure this out um, and give good policy advice. Thank you. Amy, thanks so much. That was great. And uh, I am happy to admit that I am not addicted to the radio. So at least I can check that off of my, my list of COVID concerns. Um, and would love in the Q&A to, to speak more about this question of what other variables outside of gender you think might predict outcomes here. Uh, and would encourage anyone who wants to enter questions in the Q&A to go ahead and do so. Otherwise, I have a barrage of my own that, that will be coming your guys' way in a minute. Uh, but Erica, would love to turn to you now. Although I'm actually not seeing Erica. Ah, there we go. Oh, you see me? Excellent. I do now, <laughs> thanks. On. So what do I push on? Can you see that? Yes, we can. And I always appreciate the ironies of doing these tech calls when I have the same problems with my technology. I yes, hate that. And I have my teenage son right next to me for this because I never mind talking, but I always worry about connection. So, uh, how, I, how appropriate. <laughs> okay, but yes, we can see you now. Yes, I really enjoyed the chocolate bar analogy. That was awesome because a lot of the time when we're talking with parents, we're constantly saying, if your kid is experiencing issues with gender identity or socialization or isolation, it's going to show up in their online life and that we need to pay attention to that. So that was really interesting. I'm really happy to be here. I'm Erica Delavin. I'm one of the co-founders of a nonprofit called My Digital Tattoo. I think it's actually appropriate during this conversation about our expanding our definition of wellness to support and include online connection to talk about the way we were uh, chose our name, My Digital Tattoo. And I think eight years ago when we started working in the classroom, and we've now had the privilege of working with over 20,000 kids in face-to-face -face conversations from fourth grade to 12th grade, and they are definitely our experts and have a lot to share with us. We thought we would be teaching them about how to create a positive digital tattoo and how to be mindful about what they say and the sites they see and really be able to control the device rather than the device controlling them. I think what we learned pretty soon into it is that not only do we need to teach kids about their tattoo, but we really need to think about how they're impacting other people's tattoos by and mental health by what they post and the things they forward and what they like. So I thought it would be interesting to share with you what we've uh, learned just in the time that we've been with our students around how their use has changed and where they're going on their platforms during this time of sheltering in place and COVID. And we found it really interesting. And one of the things that I lead at My Digital Tattoo is the Media in the Middle podcast. It's a podcast by students uh, for parents, kind of as a fishbowl to listen to them have conversations about what they're struggling with. And this year, uh, as COVID started, we have a quarantine, T-E-E-N, uh, show, as well as our advisories and our internships that keep us up to date during this time of COVID. So this is no surprise to anything, but most of our students would say that almost overnight, teens lost what they value most, their autonomy, their independence, and their social connection. We have a lot of our kids that say, we just thought we'd be gone for two weeks and be back, or we were seniors, we didn't even get to see people to say goodbye to them or have any of the rituals we need. And things really changed overnight. But I think what has been most surprising to me in my conversations with kids is that the black hole was really for parents. They had to learn how to do their work online. They had to rely on their kids to help them, as I just did, to get back on to the screen and sheer panic. Uh, they're interested in changing their Zoom backgrounds. And kids have are already taken on a leadership role with their kids. But even though the parents were in the dark, I feel like our kids really knew how to navigate some of it. 
And one of the things that I think has been fascinating is, and I think it's important for us to remember, because I know that when I talk with Jeff a lot and, and his student, Angela, we talk a lot about the idea that it's all bad, that all technology is bad. And one of the things that I think is interesting that you both talked about is what kind of technology are they using and for what purpose? And I loved what Kelly said about how exhausted they are with Zoom fatigue and using the classrooms and, and how, how much it's, it's just increased. But I want to point out that from our kids during COVID, they will say that many of them say that their mental health is improving. And I think this is important for us to, to think about, that we don't put our own anxiety onto our kids' experience. So for some of our kids are saying they're resting from the pressures of school, that actually we used to say that they were so busy with all their extracurriculars that getting online was the only time they had time to connect. But now they're finding that they don't have as much pressure and after school activities, teachers have calmed down a little bit about what's expected of them. I love this one that there's a freedom from social anxiety and commitments. For a lot of our kids, they said, yeah, you know, I, I hate going to the prom and I hate being in big groups and I hate looking on social media and seeing what everyone else is doing. It makes me completely anxious. It's a time for them to look at new hobbies and I'll tell you how they're doing that, an opportunity to get to know their families better. One of the kids said, yeah, I'm with my mom so much now, I actually know how weird she is. Like I didn't even realize how weird she is. So a time to really get to know them and be frustrated with them and kind of navigate that. A chance to take a break from social media, which I know sounds really strange, but the kids are saying, some of them, that they're bored or there's not much new or the news that they're watching is too overwhelming. So they're choosing to actually, and I'll talk about the app they're using to do that, but to step away. And the part that I think is really interesting during the Black Lives Matter and um, and the pandemic is that it's an opportunity for virtual volunteering and activism, much of which um, I'll show you where they're doing that as well. But like always, uh, if you have an existing mental health issue, there are also uh, our teens who are finding that uh, this is amplifying their experience and making it harder for them. They're going, some going to homes that are not safe and uncomfortable. The financial stress is uh, they're taking on and having many of our teens to go back to work to deal with helping out their families. There's a lot of tension in paying rent. So uh, those things still exist, but these are the ones I wanted to tell you about. Um, and I'll try to go quickly, the heightened awareness of the uncertainty, uh, the generalized anxiety about what's going on. And many of our kids say that they catch that from their parents who have on the news or conversation about that all the time. The anticipatory grief is interesting to me. It's not, it's already feeling bad for things you're not going to be able to do. Next year, we won't be able to go to college. Next year, we won't be able to have a prom. Um, a lot of kids telling me they're alone with their thoughts, which are really scary. The fear of being forgotten if you can't be connected. Um, I'll talk about productivity pressure when we talk about Instagram. And the anger and rage, and I think all of us can relate to this, that we're kind of all on edge and that the people who are closest to us, we go off on, but we're also seeing that happen on social media, that people are putting a lot of anger in there. So I'm just gonna quickly talk about uh, expanding our definition of wellness to uh, include online connection. I think for most adults, we always think that we have to go to a therapist or a good friend to unwind all the stuff in our head. And I think that's still a good place to go. And I know a lot of my therapist friends are moving to, to Zoom to have those conversations. But I actually think our kids are doing a lot of this on their phones. So I loved this. The second or third day that COVID started, I got this text from my son, who I told you is in the tech field, that said, to my parents that say, uh, playing video games would never pay off in the real world, checkmate. And it really made me think, that was from Alex, it really made me think, our kids are on this. Like, even though we're all scared to how it's gonna work out, they have a lot of this already in place. 
So I want to talk to you a little bit about how teens are using the apps and influencers and platforms to navigate their mental health and to really stay connected. So the first one is Snapchat, which has definitely replaced texts. Our kids are saying they're using more FaceTime. They're even uh, FaceTiming more with family members, uh, doing it more so they can see face to face. I think I mentioned productivity pressure that the kids are feeling on Instagram when they feel like everything they look at, people are making sourdough or reinventing themselves or doing their own haircut. Uh, they are doing all of that um, watching on Instagram. They're having a lot of fun on TikTok. I think you mentioned this, Kelly, spending a lot of time on TikTok. They're getting a little bugged that parents are getting in. We had one kid's my mom wanted to do a graduation TikTok with all of us. So that was very embarrassing to her. Uh, but they like it because they see people that look like them. They know that anybody can do it. TikTok has been a place where they're enjoying themselves, having fun. There's a constant stream. They're doing Netflix parties where they can connect and watch movies together. They're uh, getting on Reddits to the subreddits that mean something to them and have deep conversations in those places that are safe and people have commonality. Uh, they're watching a lot of YouTube, how-to YouTubes. We have kids telling us they're getting better at makeup, at giving a haircut to one of their family members, at learning how to do something they always wanted to do. And then, of course, our kids who are going on Twitch and watching gamers and watching esports and actually getting better by watching other people play the game, talking on their discords together. Peer power and community, our kids are going to places to get the support they need. Anonymity is one of them that I think is so important that they can share their struggles in a space where maybe they wouldn't with their friends. So the first one is the Butterfly Project. It's for self-harm. Uh, Project Semicolon is a place for depression where there's support groups and places to do things uh, for depression and the Trevor Project that supports LGBTQ kids. So they're really creating their own communities there. These are the self-help and support apps that I love. They use cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, I'm a counselor at a high school and I used to give out handouts or books for kids to use, but instead of me picking them now, kids can find the ones that work best for them. These are self-motivated. They use cognitive behavioral therapy. They may have a focus like anxiety, or if you're anxious and are suicidal, there is an app you can use that notifies several people that you're not in good shape, apps for depression, apps for um, mindfulness. And then lastly, there are the new online counseling and therapy. Uh, I think many of you probably know Crisis Text Line that maybe teens are more comfortable texting than calling our own suicide hotlines. But there are also places like Wobot, which is actually just a chat bot that guides users through the management of depression and sends little notifications like, hey, how you doing? Okay, or hope you're having a good day. When I first heard about it, I thought, no way. But the teens really react to it. They really feel like someone's there. So that's me. Thank you. We have our podcast and our Facebook. And I will stop sharing my screen. Erica, thank you so much. And finally, a good bot. I'm, I'm, I'm always looking for a good bot. <laughs> so we have not seen too many of those lately. Um, I think this was incredibly helpful in thinking about um, you know, whether use of social media and technology under COVID is actually contributing to the problem or if it's really only a problem with children who have existing mental health issues or other extenuating circumstances around COVID dysfunction in the home or something that are more problematic. So this was very, very helpful. Um, just as an aside, and as, as you guys may know, it's been interesting to talk with some of the social media platforms, trust and safety programs. And they have, I mean, we work a lot around questions of disinformation but when it comes to self-harm, just how many automated mechanisms they have developed to start identifying people that may be at risk of self-harm, particularly youth, and sending them automatic messages and connections to some of these helplines that you referenced. So it's been interesting to see social media companies taking sort of a proactive yeah. step and directing people to resources. And I think in some instances, even notifying law enforcement when self-harm right. is mm -hmm. a possibility. Yeah. Um, Lots of questions and would encourage folks on the line 
uh, to go ahead and jump in if they have some. Um, but the first one, because it's been, I think, on all of our minds so much, and I'm going to see if I can just quickly share um, a screen relating to this, is a question about the digital divide. Um, this is from uh, colleagues at Common Sense Media. Um, and because there's a lot of content here, I'll just quickly hit on it. But just the number of students in rural areas that don't have adequate connectivity, you know, close to 40%. Um, by race and ethnicity, all obviously much higher um, percentages of groups uh, that have no connectivity, especially in the uh, African American and Native American communities. And then this point that even in states with the smallest digital divides, one in four students are still lacking adequate internet access. Uh, so would love to just, um, at risk of getting people to look too long at a slide with too many details, I will stop sharing this, but would just love to hear any of your thoughts on how you see this digital divide playing out in your research and other concerns that you might have for less advantaged communities when it comes to um, social well-being and tech. And Amy, I mean, even whether this is a variable that you've looked at at boys versus girls, if there are other variables there. The digital divide is one of many divides, you know, and I think that something like COVID um, or any major trauma in society always shows them in, in a lot more and a lot more prominence than in kind of normal life. And so naturally the digital divide is incredibly important and it goes alongside other divides like kind of rooms in the home, being able to um, have personal space as a teenager, being able to have support when you're at school um, during homeschooling. And there are a lot of researchers kind of in my department who are working on different kind of facets of this divide, you know, and naturally as tech research, we look at the digital divide, which is incredibly important. Um, and it's something we've been thinking about a lot here in the UK. We also have it, you know, we're, we're a smaller country, um, but there is a, a huge, huge difference between internet connectivity. And that's in increasingly important now that technology is the way that we live our everyday lives. Um, in a review paper that I wrote with Sarah Jane Blakemore, who's an expert in adolescence and Livia Tomova at MIT, um, for the Lancet Child and Adolescent Health, we really focused in on how for teenagers, social connection and social interaction is such a key developmental feature of life. And now that most of it is happening online, um, you know, that's really important. And that it's great that, you know, we're now um, sheltering in place at the current time because we can connect online, but it's still not the whole of society. And we often forget that. In terms of measurement, um, I... I was funded by um, Barnardo's, which is a children's charity in the UK, to do some work on disadvantaged children um, and their tech use. And for uh, the last year, so 2019, and it's a lot more complicated than you expect because disadvantage isn't like gender or, or um, age. It's a lot more multifaceted and it's a lot more difficult to actually figure out what you want to measure. You know, do we want to measure household income? Do we want to measure deprivation of the area? Do we want to measure whether they're on free school meals? And so we found that the picture is actually really complicated. But something interesting is that we didn't, for example, see that the link between social media use and well-being is a lot more negative for those in disadvantaged households. Um, quite the opposite at times, we, we saw that they're actually the people who don't seem to have that negative correlation there. So it shows us that technology might also be really important to lift those people out of uh, certain neighborhoods and allow them to connect. I've now talked too much, so I'll let the others um, answer as well. Yeah, that was very helpful. Other thoughts on this? I have a relatively quick one, because um, I agree with everything Amy was saying, but what, one is that it's experience. So, you know, we think about like short term, medium term and long term solutions to the way that um, you know, the negative effects of online technologies. And one of the medium term ones is that if you don't have access to it, you literally don't get a chance to practice. And almost like any other social skill without just time spent doing stuff and practicing and getting feedback and figuring out what's, what can this do. Um, 
you, you run into problems and you're more likely to, um, to get tripped up. We see this with older adults. Um, uh, in some informal interviews we've done, uh, people that used email before they retired, uh, they're, they're pretty good with social media. They understand you know, when misinformation is coming or not. They can figure out who's in their network and who's not. People that didn't have any access to, to email, so people in their 80s and 90s, they really struggle just to understand the basic sort of like concepts of the way that social media works. It doesn't work like a letter, right? So I think that practice and experience is hugely important. And if you don't have access to it, um, that's a giant problem. And the last thing I'll say is the pandemic has just made all of these divides even that more problematic. I have a friend that's a kindergarten teacher and it just broke her heart because she would see a couple of kids in the class where they have one computer in their house that's shared amongst everybody. And they, you know, the kids just could not do what they were being asked to do because the assumption is everyone has connectivity, everybody has you know, devices. So yeah, I think it's a huge uh, issue for lots of different reasons. Yeah, thank I'm you. I'm just gonna follow up on what Jeff was saying. My sister is the principal in an underserved community. And she asked all of the families if they wanted laptops when COVID started. And they, many of them said we had one, but what they didn't realize was that they had one and there were five people that needed to use it. Uh, the other problem that I'm hearing a lot from kids is that um, they're feeling like, uh, our teachers are feeling like they can't, they can't teach to the younger kids because the parents aren't available to help and it requires two people to get online and to learn or to supervise youth um, while they're using their devices. So that can be create a divide to the people who are essential workers and need to go out and aren't there to supervise the learning and those that can stay home and supervise. Yeah. Thank so you. My sister definitely. is doing a program now where she teaches a part of her class from five to eight at night so parents can be there to help with uh, the learning. Great. Thank you. And um, Jeff, I appreciate your point about this, this concern about older generations. And I think it's quite consistent with what we've seen in the disinformation space that something like 80% or upwards of disinformation is shared by these much older populations. I think because of some of the reasons you mentioned. Um, okay, I'm gonna to go to three questions that have come in from the audience and then a couple more um, that I have on my own. But if others have questions, please go ahead and throw them up there. Uh, and I'm appreciating that with this webinar more so than any that we've had before, it has such direct relevance to people's lives that we have mm -hmm. questions that are very specific to, to mm -hmm. um, to their own um, interest. So I'll go ahead and list all three and then let any one of you respond. Um, so one is this question around um, the and it maps, I think, Jeff, to your points about uh, screen time. Is this helpful at all as a measure, perhaps even just longitudinally? Do we get rid of the whole thing? Um, or is there some role or way to think about screen time that is helpful or meaningful? Second is a question about um, the physical impacts of tech use, and I'm not sure that folks on this call would have um, a, a view on this. Um, you know, does it the effect on people's eyes, headaches, the night shift? Like, how do we mitigate the effects that these technologies are having on us physically right now? Uh, and then a third one around particular, uh, and I'll sort of elevate this question a little bit more broadly. Uh, the question was, you know, are there particular platforms? Uh, I think maybe Erica, this one is for you, um, for teens who like to write or draw that, that you recommend. But I guess overall, do you have a sense of like, here are platforms I think are a net good. And maybe here are some that on average I would stay away from because I presume they're not all treated uh, equally. Mm -hmm. So right. um, Jeff, maybe you want to start with, do we care about um, screen time? Yeah, I will, though uh, I should probably ask Amy to weigh on this too because Hannah is my student and she and I have been talking about um, this issue a lot, And but she's put it in, in, in a way I haven't thought about before, which is there even any value in thinking about screen time? And my guess is that, that, that there probably is in the short run of research. Um, it, one reason is because people um, are thinking about in terms of like, how much am I doing and is, that, is it fitting into what I want to do in my life or not? Um, so the number one argument that my daughter, who's nine and I have, uh, is how long she can be on her iPad watching shows. And she loves watching things like Netflix and she goes on YouTube and we've th talked a lot about that. But what she really needs practice at is 
knowing how to, to stop. And I think if we continue to be like, well, you're only allowed this much time and we create all this technology to force that into that, that's um, preventing people like my daughter from developing the skill sets they'll need to know when enough is enough. Um, I'll just finish by saying I have done some uh, ride alongs to Erica and the My Digital Tattoo team's uh, workshops with kids. It was so amazing to listen to the kids uh, talk about what their concerns were. It's related to the second question and uh, Erica knows more about this, but Erica and her team are really good at listing the kids. So they asked, what are some problems? And one of the problems was, well, my, my thumb hurts after I've played video games a lot, or my eyes hurt because I've been watching too long. And the kids were just starting to sense like, wait a minute, like this is like not good for my eyes. It's not, forget about like, is this harming my brain or making me depressed? It was like, it hurts my eyes. So I'll tell uh, Breno here, I don't do research in this area, but I have a friend that works at Apple and it focuses on this topic. And his uh, conclusion is that yes, that the night shift mode is valuable. It reduces the blue light a lot. Um, but that uh, for kids, going to bed requires some time away from the screen, it turns out, regardless of night mode. So that was his take. And that's coming from somebody that works on this very topic at Apple. Great, thanks, Jeff. And can I turn to each of you guys for maybe one minute each, and then I wanna get one final question in before sure. we have to close. I would say that when we do our parent presentations, when we talk about screen time, we tend to, we get a lot of questions about, is my kid addicted to their device? And the way we try to see it is, is it opening up their world or is it closing it down? And if it's making it so they're connecting with friends and learning about things and being passionate about what they're doing, and they can still get along and do the rest of their work, then it's opening up their life. If you start seeing it closing down their world and they're getting depressed or they're not engaging in things they like to do before, it's time to pay a little more attention. And thank you for the shout out about their bodies. They are telling us about Gamer's Thumb. They are telling us about Tech's Neck. They are telling us about their eyes hurting and being blurry. Uh, they are talking about selfie wrist. They have lots of things that are going on. We have digital yoga that they do. We have exercises for the eyes, the 20-20-20 rule, which means you look at a device for 20 minutes, take a break for 20 seconds, and look at something 20 feet away. So we are starting to think about how to take care of our bodies and breaks. Great, then I'll kind of chip in on the, the screen time question. Um, I think it's a, it's a crucial one that we're figuring out. And in the minute, I'll just whiz through that. The first thing is that I think it's, it's a, we need to, again, take the historical perspective. You know, when we're talking about radio and television, time still made sense because <laughs> it was a pretty uniform content. It was all the same for each person. But now that we're in the web 2.0, you know, it's interactive, it changes, you can actually make your own stuff, it's always different. So I think that's where the challenge for this medicalized approach that Jeff said, this dose response relationship based on time, I think that's why it's broken down in the last 10 or so years. But I still think that screen time has a place, but it's gonna, it has to have a place with other things around it. And we need to work, and this is work that me and my Andy Shabilsky at Oxford are doing a lot with UK policy pressing for kind of data release um, that we need to have a better idea of the technological world. And I think that will be a lot about collaboration between tech companies and researchers that is not completely disproportional in terms of power relationships. Um, but yeah, I think that screen time, we need to study screen time as if it were a concept. You know, figure out what drives people to say they have a lot of screen time, you know, are there well-being impacts and their gender, age, you know, how does, and once we maybe figure out what drives that as a measurement, it is still a valuable measure. And it's still a valuable measure because we have such great longitudinal data on it. So I wouldn't throw it out of the window, but we need to put it in context. Thank you, Amy. Okay, um, one last lightning round of questions, if I may. Uh, because we are a policy center at an academic institution, would love 30 seconds from each of you on if you had the answer to one question, what would it be? What research question do you think is most pressing that we need an answer to? Or, and Jeff, kind of going back to your slide earlier about how we dealt with automobiles and there were tech and education and regulatory responses, 
if there was one policy you could recommend either for governments to impose or for platforms to adopt voluntarily, any thoughts on that? So we'd love to, to maybe give you each, you know, 30 seconds to respond to that. And then uh, uh, to make your job even more complicated, um, if there are any written resources or links that you would want to share with the audience to go ahead and throw those up. Um, in the chat now while you are, you know, patting your head and rubbing your stomach of answering these questions and, and, and putting in links at the same time. And if that's not possible, send me the links and I will uh, uh, get them up on the site. Well, I'll go really fast because uh, I'd like to uh, promote a, an op-ed that just came up by my colleague, uh, Janine Zechariah, that talked about um, the new bill by Representative Ishu that w wants to limit micro-targeting of political ads. So I think this is a very concrete um, step around regulation uh, that we can take now. I, I think a lot of regulations tend to, that we academics talk about tend to be really general, uh, but this is very concrete. It's going to prevent um, uh, political campaigns from basically hiding in plain sight by doing racist or sexist or um, uh, incivil kind of advertisements. And so they'll have to advertise it at a, at a certain scale. So that way it's not like, somebody they've identified as a racist will get the racist ad and nobody else will see it. So well, I'll, I'll send you the link to that, Janine. I mean, uh, I can't. A great point, I, and this is a space I worked in for almost 10 years, and we'll say defining a political ad is just about the hottest mess I've ever run into, but I think it's an important measure. And um, it's been interesting that uh, I think Twitter and then second, uh, Facebook had uh, decided to decline to accept political ads. And um, so it's been a very interesting debate. Um, who can I ask to go next? Erica? I, I can go next. I would really like it there to be a policy mandate that kids need to have early digital learning uh, in their classrooms. I think that's really important, how to navigate technology and use it safely and ethically. Uh, sort of like I know we now have health ed or sex ed mandated in the California classrooms. I'd love to see digital health be part of the everyday classroom discussions mandated. Amy, last week. Right, then I'll, yeah, I'll finish off. Um, I think I'll take the meta perspective here. Um, as an academic institution in policy, we need to think about how academia interacts with policy. And I think something I've been thinking about a lot is how science is just really slow and it's supposed to be slow. We're supposed to criticize, we're supposed to scrutinize. However, technological change is accelerating. It's really fast. And we know that technologies entrench very quickly. They become part of our society. They change how we act. They change how we earn our money. They change how we live our lives. And so they then become really difficult to regulate. I think we see that with social media. A lot of the regulation, I feel like it's patching up you know, things on the surface. Um, and so the question is, how do we do policy, evidence-based policy in this time? And I think that I've been talking a lot with policymakers in the UK and we feel like maybe it needs to move from evidence-based to evidence-focused and we need to take more risks in policy and then invest a lot of time and money into evaluating that policy decision once it's made. I think we've seen that now with COVID you know, you can put scientists in a room and make them come to a decision, even if they don't have all the answers and all the consensus. And I think that that's, that we don't have that link yet sorted in a time when, you know, there is a huge strain on that. Um, and again, this is in the paper <laughs> that I'm like doing <laughs> advertising at every point in this talk. Um, but yeah, I've talked a lot more about it in there. Oh, good. Thank you. Well, Amy, and, and to support your further advertising, Amy, if you can Oh, it did go to attendees, great. Um, well, thank you all so much. This has been a huge um, help to have you all take the time to do this. It's been totally fascinating and one of the more, as I said, practical um, uh, webinars that we've hosted, uh, especially for me who is going to have a teenager sooner than I would like. Um, so I wanted to now turn, and if I can ask uh, my colleague David to, to show where we're headed next. Um, our next webinar will be on July 15th. Uh, I am thrilled to say that it is going to be guest hosted by my colleague, Marie Chashake, who is a top tech legislator in European Parliament. It is my birthday, so she is taking over to save me from having to moderate in the morning. And we will have a conversation about cyber peace with, I believe, Camille Francois and leaders from, the, from Graphica and leaders from the Cyber Peace Institute. Uh, so we'll be looking forward to that. 
Uh, but most importantly, thank you, uh, Amy and Erica and Jeff for taking the time today. Really, really appreciate it. Stay well.